Thank you, Emma Jean. So welcome to the session. So we're delighted to have uh, Javier, Leo and Juliana uh, join us for this session. So they'll be talking about uh, open data as a driver of critical, critical, critical data literacy in higher education. Um, so this is a, a session I think is going to be uh, very useful and uh, uh, hopefully to you all as well. So um, they're going to be exploring the edu educational potential of open data. So I'm going to stop sharing slides and um, hand it over to Javier, Gianna, and Leo. OK, great, Martin. Thank you very much there, Javier, and other 65 people. Uh, I'm becoming rather shy, and let's start this session. But before uh, starting, uh, I wish to thank the ALT and the OER20 committee for making this possible. Uh, in in a context of, of terrible stress and disruption for, for each of us. And to all the participants here as OER20 community, because being here uh, is believing in, in this effort we are all doing. And I believe my feeling is that there is something profoundly ethical in making things rolling on in times of crisis and not just confinement. Uh, so far in this workshop with uh, Javiera and Leo Haveman, uh, we bring a perspective over a topic that has been obsessing us in the last, say, five years, uh, which is uh, open data as open educational resources. That uh, in the left, you see the hashtags if you want to comment something uh, and join the mainstream in, in, in the Twitter. And we believe that this could be a driver of data literacy, but also of uh, empowerment and critical data literacies. And we'd like to share this, this perspective and discuss our ideas uh, with you. Maybe you become, you'll become as obsessed as we are on the topic. So, um, uh, you probably be asking yourself a number of questions like which data, which openness, and particularly which care in times of certification where data is seen as a sort of monster. So let's play around these questions. Uh, I'm giving the floor to Javiera Atenas. Uh, she surely will be better equipped than, than me to start this ball rolling. So, Javiera, the floor is, is yours. Hey, uh, thank you. Thank you, Juli. Uh, I'm really glad to, to see you all here. Um, we, we are not panicking. It's 72 people in the room, and so we're not panicking. Um, what we're trying to... Uh, do today and, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be great fun is to take you through a, roughly through a presentation just to contextualize you all in what we understand of, of open data, how is it valuable, how it can be used as an open educational resource, but also how uh, how we can play a little bit, like we can do a little uh, data expedition all together uh, to see how we can start using open data in our, in our teaching. Uh, of course, because I think it's first on teaching and then on research. Uh, so, Juli, if you can, um, well, so when we talk about open data, one of the things we need to, to consider is that open data uh, provides, in a way or another, equal opportunities to participate in, 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 in democratic processes. People have the right to be consulted and participate. So, in a way or another, for people to access information apart from documents and files, uh, people need to have the right to access data, but also they need to be trained in how to use the data. Uh, Juli? So, open data is just simply data that it's been uh, opened up and uh, made publicly available by governments, by uh, of research institutions by the civil society and it's data they can be freely used reused and redistributed by anyone without any um, 
barrier. So uh, next one, if you can, please. So the, the basic conceptualization and the principles of, of, of when data, it needs to be uh, available for everyone, uh, needs to enable universal participation. That means it needs to be accessible and understandable for everyone. That means that it's non-proprietary, but also it's non-discriminatory. And also that is timely and accessible. And this is very, very important right now. If we see how much um, data uh, open science is, is, is using right now to, to deal with the crisis, with the uh, coronavirus uh, crisis, yeah, data needs to be timely. Uh, because if data is not produced, um, its data is, is, is not made available with, a, with an open license. People cannot reuse it, cannot uh, redistribute it, cannot study it without having to go through copyright clearance. So it needs to be license free and also needs to be machine processable. So that's kind of the key elements of, of open data. Uh, if we can move forwards, Holly. Um, but also there is a value, a social value of, 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 of open data. It's not just a technical value. It's it's how people can really use uh, uh, data for for their daily lives. So one of the bits is social civic monitoring. Um, the people that really, really rock on civic, civic monitoring is, is Italy, uh, Monitor Italia and, and other organizations work with citizens, for example, to uh, mm, control and review how much money the government is spending in different things. So it's kind of in a bit of participatory budgets, but also uh, understanding how the money is, is, is spent. And this is something that we should all be doing right now. So where the money is going. Um, also, uh, is, is a great resource for scientific communities. We've seen the value of open data these days where uh, scientists from China, from all over the world are sharing the data uh, and trying to find a cure for, for what, what's going on. Uh, also foster transparent uh, research practices. And when we say, okay, how, how can that can foster transparent research practices. So when you share your data alongside with the papers or with, with your reports, it means that people can assess if your methodology is correct or uh, do new findings and that prevents bad science. Um, helps to, to, to develop our scientific uh, skills. So how people learn to, to, how people learn to do research. How do you learn to do research? Uh, if you have access to, to open data, you can replicate uh, the models that all this I have been using so you can gather and gain gain skills and um, break the silos between uh, teaching and research and this is something that is really close to my heart. Um, uh, when when you bring data to, to the classroom, the same data that you, you may use as, as a researcher, uh, because we'll we'll do research here. So if you bring the data they're using uh, as a researcher and involve your students in the methods, in the way that you, you you do the teaching with, or you do sorry, you do your research with your data, and ask them to help you to find things. You participate with them in doing research. You help them to develop uh, research research skills. But also, you can bring real social life problems to the to the classroom. Uh, one of the things, for example, if you use uh, transfer for uh, transfer uh, data or um, for data or international data and you can bring a problem a specific problem and show it to students so they can um they can try to solve issues or solve problems through through the data and who produces the data uh the world bank the united nations so if you want to see uh, education uh, data uh, you just go to the unesco institute of 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 statistics and you will gather data from there uh you have the national government so yes you can gather uh data from the scottish government uh, there should be a Scottish data portal. Uh, there you have the UK open data portal. Uh, you have little uh, local governments, so London's data, Barcelona's data, which is actually really good. Then you have non governmental institutions. So, for example, Monitor Italia, that, that, that's a great, great release of data. Then you have, uh, for example, the NASA or, or the European Space Agency that are putting the data up so people can just go and use the data just to deal with astronomy issues and uh, and then you have uh, 
uh, research data platforms. So, for example, Zenodo and, and BigShare, where people can just or deposit their data or just go and retrieve their data. Uh, so, yeah, it's this is where you can get data from. And that's from me so, so far. Um, I'm going to pass the mic back to my colleagues. Hi everyone, um, and so at this point, um, I thought it was um, useful. Well, we really wanted to relate the theme of this um, of this workshop to the um, the theme of the conference, the care and openness, um, and to think about um, a, a couple of different senses in in which um, care relates to data. So, um, of course, we we tend to think of openness. Um, and and caring as kind of natural friends um, that the in this in the sense of caring for each other in the sense of um, that um, you know through providing open data and transparency with um, uh, the the opportunity to, uh, to learn from each other to um, have become better informed to um, to have the opportunity to um, critique um, the activities of um, governments or researchers or civil society organizations um, to, to be informed about what they're doing and, and be able to form our own um, our own views about these things but of course in the in the data context just as in the open education context crit critical approaches have asked us to um, to think carefully about whether being open automatically uh, makes something good or automatically makes uh, makes uh, is or, openness is automatically caring. We also um, need to think in the sense of care as careful. How, why we need to be careful, and I think in this context of uh, datification um, that we that we live in, uh, we we need to think really carefully about the relationship between. Um, that sort of realities in the world and how they get represented as data, and um, and understanding that there is is not necessarily a a natural transparent link um, between um, between data sets and um, and and realities lived realities of people in the world, um, and so that's an area in which we need to be quite careful as well as in the wider sense of notification of where we have corporations um, spying on us as their uh, kind of business model. So, um, so that that brings us into this question of how can we use open data in higher education. So first of all, um, one of the great things that um, students can be doing is collaborating with researchers in real research projects. Uh, rather than merely studying the research that's already been done, uh, they can actually work with the uh, real data that's that's being collected um, and uh, sort of studying that as it comes in and being part of those kind of um, new analyses and new discoveries. Um, it's a great opportunity for interdis interdisciplinarity, so for students working across um, across uh, problems and issues that uh, cannot be that, that are that are complex and cannot always be solved merely with the tools of one discipline. So working with other students that kind of bring different knowledge um, to the table. Um, it's great for scenario-based learning activities. Um, it's great for collaborating with local communities working on real problems. So so this is. Um, uh, um, there's um, a lot of work now um, starting. Um, it's really um, prominent in Canada, I've noticed. Um, and it's also, there's a bit of this happening now at my um, institution where I work, UCL, on community engaged learning. And that's really where students are um, are looking at um, issues that are faced by um, uh, kind of organizations or um, communities um, out um, out there, and um, how a, a piece of research that they that they do might be able to contribute to um, informing them and supporting them with their with their issues. Um, and so, for um, for civic engagement, um, obviously there, there is there are going to be different degrees of um, of control over data and data concepts um, depending on. Um, how much um, you know? How much training experience you have with them, and so um, so we we really propose though that anyone at any level can start working with data. You have to design the um, 
the task um, to be um, appropriate to the, the, the level at which they can engage. So we think that there are, there are initial tasks that are suitable for all levels. Um, there are some trying to be more appropriate for undergraduates, um, some um, where, where postgraduates are going to be able to really use their m much more advanced skills um, to, to do something that looks a lot more like um, academic research projects. We'll share the slide so that you, you don't need to try and read all of this now. Um, and um, uh, an, another really interesting way of, uh, of working with um, open data is in a context of data journal, um, where you're both uh, working with the, um, all the relevant uh, kind of data literacies and skills, but also um, <clears throat> transforming that knowledge in, and communicating it. So you're, you're working on uh, kind of turning that into, into narratives, into explanations, translating it for um, people who don't know the data to understand what the data is saying. Um, and so that's a re really um, exciting area. And um, so in terms of embedding open data in teaching and activities, um, we think it's really important to identify and describe learning outcomes for the activities, identify portals for sourcing the data, clearly identify and describe challenges students might face, um, so try and anticipate some of the issues that will be challenging for them. Um, I think getting them working in teams is really important there so that they can support each other and not be, not be just um, kind of um, alone in it. Um, provide training materials for the course students will need to use and also supporting students to communicate their findings. Um, uh, so in other words, doing, doing assignments that are um, available openly rather than um, the, the um, dreaded disposable assignments um, that we uh, talk about often in open education. And, um, and then I think I'm handing over to Huli. So uh, my turn to keep digging on the issue of care with the question you see. And let's use uh, the images to uh, the bad luck that can be only opened with the right key, but there are many keys. Which is the right one? And this has to do with what Leo was saying uh, before, that we need data literacy. That we have been mapping uh, the, the, the approaches to uh, conceiving data literacy, and we found out that there is uh, information literacy, and numeracy, statistical literacy, and recently uh, we have uh, frameworks uh, and trying to characterize the skills needed to uh, handle data and to uh, reproduce, visualize, present, uh, embed data into narratives. And one thing we came across in all these models is that uh, most of them are focused on, uh, on uh, technical skills. Uh, even in the case of visualization as part of, uh, for example, uh, data storytelling. But what about a critical perspective? A critical perspective in the sense that we need to be able to see the crisis, the biases, the pitfalls in data abundance, as, as Leo was saying before. So let's move quickly to something where we are all going to uh, say uh, what we think about this problem as educator in our role as educator being uh, educational technologists or adults educators or um, teachers people working at several levels in education so we are you going to use a mentimeter uh, some of you probably know this uh, interaction tools so for those working uh, from a pc station uh, you can open a new tab and go to menti.com and then uh, type the number uh, below 316986. Uh, those that have a, a mobile can scan the QR, QR code. Or you can also uh, um, just uh, type Minty and also introduce the, the sequence, the number sequence. So I need to move to Mentimeter. So you can see, you'll see from here from, uh, okay. So let's do this full screen. So uh, you'll be able to see this uh, on, on the on the blackboard. 
uh, shared space. And you will also see this from your tab on the Mentimeter, the interactions. We are going to comment all the interactions. Just for informed consent, those not willing to share the, the information that we are going to open and share with all of you uh, can just uh, follow this interaction position and uh, not send uh, replies because we cannot identify you and we cannot uh, we cannot uh, remove the data but we are going to take care about uh, uh, anonymization uh, so the first question is do you use data in your teaching activities in the way uh, Javier and Leo were describing uh, which type of data, even, even if it's data taken from reports, uh, uh, written reports, uh, and uh, digital uh, raw data or data coming from, okay, great. So we are having the first uh, here, first interactions. Great. Thank you, Mark, for sharing uh, the link and the uh, number. So um, I encourage people to use open data. So we have people here that is already experienced in this approach. Um, not a teacher, mm, but if you are an instructional design, designer, you could support, or, or a librarian, you could support others to use open data, for example, research open data, treasure within your uh, university. So let's see, let's move. We have 17, 18 interactions, very interesting. A range of data, use images, text, and numeric data as examples. I use research data and collect such as social network analysis. Uh, okay, great qualitative image and all the uh, open data from repositories. These are very interesting uh, experiences. So uh, I see uh, in part you are already experienced, but it will be interesting to follow uh, these uh, um, stories about open data uh, connecting to the problems and the issues we find. Uh, so I'm going to move uh, to the next interaction and I'm going to ask you how comfortable do you feel with the word data uh, in terms of data in teaching and learning and data in the society. You are already engaging with data as, as we see in the other slide. Oh. Great. So we have people that is feeling cool, really, really cool. Let's see how this change, the picture changes with uh, uh, responses, five. We are at five responses, six, seven, nine, ten, twelve. We, and this session, we are 71 people, so 19 uh, responses are uh, kind of representative, would you say so? Uh, so what we see, uh, uh, and now now we are moving to um, a third of the participants, and what we see that you are comfortable with data and teaching and learning, but not uh, that much with data in the society. We are going to handle these, these results uh, and to discuss about uh, these results. So, okay, I'm gonna move uh, to the next slide. Sorry, we have time constraints. So it's really interesting to see. We are going to share the results. No worries if you want to keep uh, answering uh, this, these interactions. Uh, and the next question, uh, could you share why do you feel fatal or cool about data? And, and mostly the replies were about data in the society. Thinking about that. I know it's a difficult question. Okay, great. We have also interactions uh, here at the at the chat. Okay, those not willing to participate in the Mentimeter can can leave their impressions uh, at the at the blackboard. Great. Okay. Data sounds very scientific, positivistic, but isn't necessary. Leads to understanding, but we need to be careful. Uh, that's not really properly described what is in one word. Uh, possible biases. 
uh, who produce data and which is connected with biases and, and, and with the claim for carefully, being carefully. Uh, data can be used to give us information about the society. You don't need to be a data scientist to make use of it uh, or understand its potential. It can be a key, but are we ready to use this key? Maybe uh, some of your impressions come from this feeling, good feeling that there is danger, there is potential, but there is also uh, danger. Let's see. I work with repositories and have been a teacher of open access and influence. So this is a very expert um, impression. Fatal. There are too many criticalities and kind of see enough of them cool. I am doing quite a lot criticizing what is data in the stuff I am teaching. Uh, so it's it's really, really great to have this uh, the several impressions because when wrapping up, we'll see that these are epistemologies and positionings relating an object. Uh, many, many uh, more impressions. I love them, uh, teaching and learning as it is my training, but in society do not feel those who are propagating in social media have the ethical analysis training. Great, need to question assumptions. Uh, I'm happy to use data in teaching, but in real life, people have poor graph of data stats and visualization. So it looks there are two uh, um, two trends in this, and it's the health concerns and the ability of, of people in the real world beyond the protected area of uh, your classroom to uh, handle with data and data. And indeed, as teachers, you are supporting your, st your students to engage with data. 26 interactions. Now, let's move to an open data expedition. will be very short, also because what I see is that most of you are already experienced on uh, uh, portals of open data or digital uh, uh, data libraries or, or other sort of repositories. But what I, I would uh, suggest to you, uh, I think we have at least finished uh, to navigate a little bit this one, one, select one of these uh, three uh, portals uh, and or repository uh, and and take a look and take a look and see what is in in there for you if there is something for you in there those that are not really experienced go to the European data portal those uh, or the uh, UNESCO portal those that are librarians probably know Zenodo or people already engaged with uh, research data can go to Zenodo uh, uh, and, and take a look. You can copy this link. Uh, I don't know whether, okay, I'm going to copy and paste the links to the Blackboard chat. So, okay, great. Martin did for me. Oh, that's marvelous, Martin. Thank you. So, uh, take a look and take a look. And when you are ready, just uh, say something at the chat. Ready, ready, did it. Uh, and uh, tell us which data portal, UNESCO, European uh, data portal, or Zenodo you visit. And, and we are going to move to the next interaction then. Great, Jade, UNESCO, OK. Zenodo, Sarah probably knows, Dan, UNESCO. It's, uh, Javier, do you want to uh, reply to Gabi, the UNESCO? UNESCO, okay, you're taking a look. Great, European data. Yes, yes, so it's not possible to put, and Andy, it's not possible to put uh, the uh, the links in the in the Mentimeter. This is something really annoying, but not possible. This is because we are sharing that way. And thank you for sharing. Okay. Just go and take a look. Experience it. In. For those, particularly those uh, not having any experience, take a look at the portals. And because these portals are being announced as, as a, a resource, as educational, mostly as open educational resources. 
And I'm doing research about open research data. And what we are seeing, uh, seeing is, I'm not going to spoil this, this, this movie. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we are seeing. That take a look as educators. OK. OK, yes. Yes, Sarah. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, saying that, uh, okay, probably you are all seeing that, but uh, connecting the dots of data in medical research is incredibly important, and particularly now in, in, uh, with the coronavirus uh, virus uh, crisis, because uh, the researchers could be uh, just uh, uh, connecting discoveries on one side to uh, make the next move, the next step. Okay, great, Javi. Thank you for replying to Gabi. So most of these, uh, as Zenodo is is curated, is like self-curated by the researchers themselves. So the researchers create the communities and upload their resources. It's, it's an open platform and it's uh, embedded into the open area platform. So it's mo mostly used by European researchers. Uh, there are also other type of, of platforms uh, similar to Zenodo uh, for the researchers. It's self-curated. Uh, but in the case of the European Data Portal and the uh, ESCO, there are more curation, uh, top-down curation from uh, the, uh, this uh, government or uh, these international bodies uh, on the type of that data and how the data has to be aggregated. Okay, so uh, due to the fact that we have to move to the next interaction, uh, we are going to stop this user experience. I hope you enjoy it and you'll be curious. Uh, and we are going to move to the next and last interaction. Tell us about your experience as uh, educator. So you can say uh, whether uh, the all the collections uh, that you uh, saw in those three portals gave you some ideas for teaching that you felt are interesting but you don't you don't see anything for your practice that uh, these are relevant uh, data like for example medical data but there is nothing for me in there and that was a nightmare and my exp experience was a nightmare we should stop all of this <laughs> so feel free and go Great. That's very interesting. You felt inspired mostly. Now you should tell in the in the chat that you felt inspired because it was a, a initial experience, or you already, as I suspect, uh, are uh, engaged with these uh, platforms, using them, and 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 got uh, inspiration for for from your own uh, approach to these. So nothing new, new. So under the sun. But uh, if if you were new, uh, yes, yes. Javier is sharing the the community, the COVID community. So if you want to uh, work with uh, students or uh, about data literacy to read COVID data or uh, the way uh, research proceeds and and so on, here is uh, real authentic material. So let's see, we have 19 interactions out of 76 people engaged in this workshop. Anyone else willing to say something? Yeah, Leo, that's, that would be great. But actually, yes, Zenodo is open. So we could, you, we could uh, create, uh, because there is crowd science. A response under the the context of a responsible research and innovation, we could re create a students uh, students research uh, communities uh, publicating, for example, the results of their authentic results of their learning uh, under uh, your your guidance as teachers. So okay, let's 
uh, uh, wrap up. Uh, so the experience was mostly inspiring in the sense that triggered some some ideas, some some inspirations. Uh, interesting, but you don't see less a little bit less. Uh, also, the fact that this um, might have to be to do with the fact that the relevant data is not there, or maybe uh, it's it's uh, put it there in a way that we cannot interact, and, and nobody had a terrible experience. This is good. So I'm going to move now to uh, wrapping up this session. So thank you very much for your participation because, sorry, okay, let's move to the next. And now let's reflect a little bit using uh, a sort of frame to think about our experience and our positionings uh, in the sense that as you can see, um, there is a, a first thing has to do with uh, how do we position in relation with data in a continuum. Uh, this is a continuum I conceptually uh, draw uh, on on uh, the basis of uh, the alternative and uh, alternative epistemologies of data activism by Stefania Milan from Communication Sciences. And uh, in this continuum, some of us are in the reactive side those that are really um, like uh, being concerned about the, uh, the, the ethical problems cannot be over, overcome and the abilities are really low. So we, are, we need to prevent people or at least uh, be really careful and play with data only in very, under very controlled uh, context. Uh, there are other of us uh, with experiences or or not with enthusiasm that see in this a lot of potential and this is a more proactive positioning uh, an epistemology of data that's not better or uh, or worse than the other it's just a human positioning about a, a social technical problem an issue an emerging problem we are living by but the worst thing I didn't see uh, happily in this workshop is a naive approach. And it's uh, that approach where uh, we feel that big data will change the world, uh, world and all the tons that we could now make sense of to understand learning processes will change our life. So this is a very good thing. So. Uh, you can comment and, and, and say about your personal positionings being more reactive or proactive or naive or in which part of this continuum do you feel can keep, keep commenting. And in this quadrant graph we are seeing now, we further represented these tensions. Open data can be uh, in the right side, upper side for public, public go uh, good. But which data collected? How is that a luxury? For example, uh, teach, uh, students generated data would be very good. But is that a luxury in times where we are uh, in a hurry for uh, the basic content? If we come to all the data that is collected from private companies in the left side of this quadrant, that could become easily a commodity. To which extent should we? Uh, and act, be active or, or, or start uh, engaging in activist activism uh, against uh, this uh, data as commodity and, and the opening of some of the data uh, properly anonymized to uh, uh, release this data also as public good. So these tensions are not solved. My friends, we are not bringing here uh, answers. We are in the middle of these tensions, and you'll probably be—I uh, I suspect most most of you are in the right side 
of the of the quadrant but probably you are also uh, thinking for example for example those working in learning analytics the importance of of of, of uh, making sense of that data with uh, part, for example participatory designs engaging students and the community in using these data so we uh, here uh, uh, propose uh, some some ideas to keep on working as educators with, uh, in a data fire world uh, on data literacies, engaging with open data, and working not only the technical skills about data, but also ethics and politics of data. And the techniques are necessary to engage with data and then understand uh, what is in in for example. Uh, developing an algorithm uh, and the bias that is in it and, and promoting the aesthetics and the narrative of data and, and, and considering data as an object that can be um, in the middle of a meaning making and there is semiotics in presenting data uh, beautifully. So uh, I'm going to leave uh, uh, the word to Javiera for her to close this session. Javiera. Yeah, okay, it's, sorry, something. Can you, can you hear us now? It's, is it? Yeah, okay, I'm back. I don't know what happened. Oh bit of Schrodinger moment. Um, so few few things to, to, to close down. Uh, thanking you all um, for for what you're doing. Uh, please make sure then you uh, start thinking on how could you use uh, data because governments are spending lots of money in opening up data through the uh, transparency laws. They are forced to open up data. So your governments uh, are literally paying millions to get data available for you. So take advantage of it. Uh, that's something that we can all gain uh, uh, learning from uh, understanding how our national data portals work. Um, also, think about very carefully if you're using data related to populations uh, about how will you care for for the people that you're studying? Uh, this is this is one the the, the map that I'm, that I'm showing you. It's it's one of the classical maps on how to show poverty. But one of the things that when we start working with humans, we need to have very close at our heart not to stigmatize a population. So have a look. Uh, look on the uh, data ethics frameworks. Uh, oh, there's also, I showed you uh, the data ethics canvas, uh, because when you work with data, you're also working with people information, and we need to be very, very, very careful with the communities on how not to harm them and how not to expose them. Um, also, uh, this is a bit of self-promotion with Leo. There is this book online, uh, it's called The State of Open Data, uh, so you can find data about agriculture, law, uh, education, infrastructure, government, and it's uh, open, it's fully online. Maybe Leo can share the link to the, to the book. Uh, it's of, of course, it's open access. Um, so it's very little uh, chapters on what's going on with open data in different uh, levels around the world. Uh, so have a look on it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that you will enjoy. It's a good, uh, good very good reading for for confinement. So uh, yeah, if you want to learn more, or if you could like to have a workshop with with us, um, just let us know. Where when when we are allowed to travel again, we'll or we can do it online, of course. We're happy to meet with you and your colleagues and take you through this data journey. Um, so yeah, that's all from us. I think Leo and Juli, we can uh, we we just leave you to to think about it, and you know where to find us. Uh, of course, we're gonna keep the chat open, so we can start uh, answering questions. So maybe if we put 
uh, the audio in, uh, we can start answering your questions. If, um, if anyone wants to grab the microphone, if you just raise your hand, uh, we can give you presenter rights and you can um, uh, use your microphone or we can pick up questions from the, the chat as well. I see Mia Cruz has put her hand up, so I'm just going to make you a presenter, Maria Cruz, and then you should be able to use your microphone now. Um, hello. A todos. Um, thank you, uh, Leo, Javiera, and Juli for this presentation, and to Martin. And Martin. Can, you cannot hear me. You cannot hear me, I guess. Okay. We, we, we can hear you. Okay, no, I thought someone was trying to tell me something. Um, no, as I say, thanks to Alt for hosting this event. As I pointed out in the chat, uh, just for so everybody can be aware of that, I think the key point is the statistical knowledge and training of, of those who are going to be working, interpreting and analyzing the open data. Because if they lack of the basic knowledge and they don't understand how to interpret data, they, we can go to situations like what happened now with the media in the UK that statistics are actually misinterpreted or changed, or not changed, sorry, or you know you can extract the information that you want from the statistics, statistics. that's what I thought that is important also to invest in the statistical training or you call it data literacy and just to, to understand how to handle the statistics. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I think I can just answer very quickly here. Uh, luckily for all of us, and thanks, Marie Cruz, uh, luckily for all of us, there is something called School of Data. Uh, that's an uh, open knowledge foundation funded project. Uh, the beauty of uh, School of Data, there is not just tutorials in English, there is Escuela de Datos for Spanish, uh, there is a Portuguese version, there is a German version. So. Regardless where you are, you just look for your local school of data that's online. So I just posted the link for the, uh, the, the English version, but there is one in Spanish that is based in Mexico. Um, the Portuguese one is based in Brazil, but all the tutorials are translated and placed online. So you can uh, start from the very basics of statistics. 100% uh, recommended. They're great. They're fantastic people. I can don't know. Um, yes. Um, Martin, do you manage for the people? Or you? So what were you saying, Eliana? Uh, yes, uh, Sarah uh, wants to ask a question. Yes, hello. Good morning, or afternoon, rather. Um, thank you for sharing School of Data. That's really helpful. Uh, I was curious um, about one of the things when we think, when I think about the, the critical appraisal of different, um, whether it's data sets or randomized trials or even system, um, systematic reviews, I, I'm always on the lookout for updated checklists for critical appraisal, and I haven't really seen many that are much more up to date for, than those that were released by the University of Glasgow uh, years and years ago. And I was wondering if anybody else had, um, you know, updated tools that they like to use, whether they're teaching in like an evidence-based medical practice or just for data literacy.
uh, Sarah, um, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, research about data literacy and, and uh, I did a systematic review of the literature recently on data literacy frameworks. Uh, but uh, these frameworks are mostly focused on the develop, development of technical uh, skills. Uh, as, for example, um, uh, critical data literacy is being dealt with uh, from uh, the lens of media education. So connected to personal data literacy, and there is some debate, for example, uh, led by uh, Selwyn and Lucy Pangrecio. But uh, no framework uh, yet to uh, analyze uh, the development of critical uh, data literacies in the sense of not only, for example, um, um, rank, data wrangling, uh, analyzing, elaborating, presenting data visualization and data storage, and also uh, considering the collectives behind data representations, how the data was collected, methodological issues. Uh, these are uh, less frequent concerns and uh, I'm engaged in, in working on, on a framework for critical uh, literacy and critical data literacy uh, from an EU project. And, and um, there are also other uh, people like Lucy Pangrassi and Nilsa, we're working on that. Uh, and I know uh, Bonnie Stewart is also uh, having a focus on that this, this afternoon. I don't know if you want, if, does that answer your question, Sarah, or do you want to follow up? Well, I'm curious about Caroline. She's saying, but I think it is not so relevant now. Yeah, I think but Caroline did have her hand up, but if she wants to ask, um, if she just puts her hand up, we can, uh, I'll give you presenter, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just to say one thing before I ask my question. I can't tell you how amazing the presentation was. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, I was just thinking, you see, uh, that all of the things, um, I'm just wondering why this being so incredibly useful and incredibly, incredibly needed, I think, nowadays. What is there that is hindering um, the doing of this in our classrooms. And I, I think I do agree with Marie Cruz when she says about the statistics that is involved and in and, and, and teach in working with data sets. And I, I agree again with Juliana when she says about the humanity. So I, I do think that that is a tricky combination. And we always have to think that when we teach this, we are in, well, I teach face to face, not now <laughs> because we're online, but I, I used to teach face to face. Um, and I think it um, to do this properly, it really devotes um, lots of preparation and some kind of feeling that you master the statistics behind whatever you're going to do. So I, I just think that all of this is is just, you know, it, it just takes a lot of time and, and, and in, it's just my worry. That's what I was saying. It's not relevant because I, I'm not sure it's true, but it's a worry I have. And, and yeah, you, I, I think it's very relevant, but I'm kind of wondering how can we, how in, how can we promote the statistics because it's also needed with the humanity so that we really do a good work when we do this with our students. Um, thank you and thank you again. The best workshop ever I have not workshop but the session I have ever been such a great session. Thanks very much. Well, Caroline, this is too much. We are just I mean sharing. Uh, concerns and this is kind of uh, conversation, familiar conversation with Javiera and Leo that we open it to all of you. And and I, I perfectly agree with your uh, uh, perspective in the sense that we need to rethink the curriculum of uh, teachers' education and uh, educators' uh, preparation. And probably we are not 
prepare and, and we need also to rethink uh ethical concern in engineering in engineering in the training of engineers and people in natural science and sciences because the the crossovers between disciplines are more and more uh, uh um frequent uh, so uh, I am really engaged in several projects. One project about learning analytics, working with a team of engineers. Engineers. Uh, another project uh, connected to uh, uh, teachers' training um, uh, to use data generated by platforms as school. So um, from these experiences, um, my uh, concern is that we are. Uh, starting to uh, need to reframe educators' uh, training uh, to deal with this conflict because in education you are going to see uh, all the disciplines to to be engaged in, in 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 one setting, like for example in school teaching or or uh, a college. Um, in in higher education, it could be. Uh, a little bit different in the sense that uh, we could be teaching a very specific subject uh, or domain and, and the data that we handle is data, as Javier said, data that comes out from our own research. So we are training the, 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 the students to handle data that we perfectly know. But in any case, in higher education, there is a still need, it's very a little spread, the idea of using own research data as open educational resources. This, this is because we are insisting. Uh, and, and OK, thank you. Also, Mike is saying, as a, a historian, uh, we need both uh, humanities uh, framing data narratives and the fact that data is, is a social construction and we need from the other side uh, uh, training, a little bit more training in what uh, uh, statistics and developing algorithms and using some uh, very um, frequent um, um, softwares. Uh, in uh, in in data science uh, mean uh, like the, the most uh, frequent practices in data science that are not so difficult are just uh, we we are not engaged in them this is the fact. Javiera. Yeah, uh, I understand the fear. Um, we also we're not from uh, we're not data scientists, so we don't do hardcore uh, big data analysis. Uh, one of the techniques that I recommend for people to start engaging, mostly when you come from the social sciences uh, or from the humanities, is uh, well to approach us. One is to start with students doing very uh, kind of research-led activities uh, using data journalism techniques, because as as we understand, most of of, of the of, of of the journalists are not uh, trained in 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 uh, statistics or statistic analysis. I, 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 as, as a big part of, of their careers. So uh, have a look in, um, into uh, how to use uh, uh, data journalism techniques and also uh, have a look on how to deal with uh, digital humanities techniques for, for dealing with data. It's, it's a way that people like us from, from, from the social sciences might, might feel much more connected. Uh, so don't try to go hard into uh, data science straight, just start this little by little with uh, data journalism and uh, uh, digital humanities. That's yes, in any case, in this session, we couldn't, of course, uh, introduce all the techniques and uh, this is uh, and requires more engagement and uh, for sure there are many uh, templates, tutorials, and uh, we should uh, I mean, do an effort to keep on working on this to build a more structured uh, field of, of, of research and practice, uh, considering all open data and data as uh, collected as an or in research as an open educational resource. So, uh, we are going to close the session because we are uh, in time. Uh, and thank you very much to all of the participants for uh, all the insights you brought to these workshops and all the ideas that uh, we shared here. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think a wonderful session and um, if we could show our appreciation um, to our presenters.
um, you can use that from the chat. You can uh, show some applause, and I can see that coming in. Um, so I, I know Rio is, as well has uh, posted a link to the session page where um, additional content has been posted as well. So um, Javier, Leo, and Juliana, thank you very much for this workshop. And um, thank you for, under such unprecedented times, um, it, I think you've done a wonderful job in, in, in making it a, a really rich online experience. So thank you all for participating in this event.